Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2021 Community Relations Commission Lunch and Learn series. My name is Carla Williams Scott, and I serve as the pleasure. I have the pleasure of serving as the director for the Department of Neighborhoods for the City of Columbus. This year, our theme for our Lunch and Learn series is access to racial justice in Columbus. I'd like to thank our Community Relations Commission for choosing such an important and timely topic. The four sessions that we will bring to you this year will feature conversations with dynamic community leaders, organizing the new civilian review, review board and resources available to help you should you experience discrimination in our city. Today, our series kicks off with a discussion focused on racism as a public health crisis. By declaring racism as a public health crisis, our leaders in Columbus and Franklin County have taken an important and vital step to recognize that racism exists and that it incurred, occurs at the individual and systemic levels. In the Department of Neighborhoods, we seek to make a difference through the Community Relations Commission's work to investigate discrimination complaints, through our New Americans Leadership Academy and work serving our newest residents, and through the work of My Brother's Keeper to empower boys and young men of color. However, even with these efforts, I recognize that there is more that can be done, and I hope that everyone in attendance today will leave with additional ideas and action steps that you can take to help make a difference in our community. I'm grateful for Charlita Tavares for moderating our discussion today. I appreciate Councilmember Priscilla Tyson, Assistant Deputy County Administrator of Human Services, Joy Bivens, and Elizabeth Joy, a licensed clinician that is working in this space for volunteering their time to serve on our panel. I'd also like to thank our Ohio Civil Rights Commission, the Franklin County Municipal Courts, and the Greater Columbus Community Trust for serving on our panel and our planning committee. And at this point, I'd also like to take a personal point of privilege to congratulate Councilmember Tyson on her upcoming retirement and to thank her for all the service that she has given over these years to our community. Her work in human services and serving as our zoning chair to ensure that all the residents in our city have a voice at the table. So thank you, Member uh, Councilmember Tyson. You will be greatly missed. It is now my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Allison Poyer. Commissioner Poye serves on the Community Relations Committee and chairs our Issues and Educations Committee. It is thanks to Allison's hard work and leadership that we are able to offer this Lunch and Learn series. So Commissioner Poye, I turn things over to you. Thank you, Director, and good day to all. Again, my name is Allison Poye, and I'm a longstanding commissioner with the City of Columbus's Community Relations Commission. I do currently chair the Issue and Education Committee, which proudly hosts this Lunch and Learn for you today. Racism and segregation in Ohio and Franklin County have led to increased health divides amongst Ohioans. As well, racism, not race, has caused disproportionate rates of homelessness, incarceration, poor education, and economic hardship for people of color. Emerging bodies of research demonstrate that racism itself is a social deterrent. In May of 2020, the county and city declared racism as a public health crisis. To highlight this declaration, the Issue and Education Committee brings to you the first of our four-part four, four Lunch and Learn series racism as a public health crisis. It is our hope that through the 2021 Lunch and Learn series, Columbus residents will feel more equipped to eliminate race discrimination in our community. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Charletta Lita B. Tavares. She is the Chief Executive Officer of Primary One Health. Through her work with Primary One, as well as her service in the Ohio State Senate, Ohio House of Representatives, and City Columbus City Council, Charlita has a distinguished record of working for social justice in our community. 
Charlita, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to an engaging conversation today. Thank you very much, Commissioner Poyer. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate all the work that you and Director Carla Williams Scott are doing uh, for our community and in our community. And I'd like to thank all of the panelists. Um, um, the panelists, as uh, Director Williams Scott shared, are Joy Bivens, who is the Director of the Franklin County Department of Job and Family Services and Deputy County Administrator. A Joy Elizabeth Joy, who is a licensed independent social worker and also an executive coach, and my friend and my former colleague on Columbus City Council, Priscilla Tyson, uh, who is the chair of the Health, Human Services, and Workforce, uh, well now Health, Human Services, and Zoning Committees. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for this important discussion. Uh, as Commissioner Poye shared, this session is on racism as a public health crisis. And as she shared, um, the city of Columbus, uh, Franklin County commissioners and the public health uh, department, as well as primary one health uh, adopted resolutions declaring racism as a public health crisis. I'm going to share a few comments um, from each of or a few uh, sections of each of those resolutions. The first uh, being Franklin County Commissioners. Uh, theirs was adopted on um, the Board of Health in May of 2020 and also the Franklin County Commissioners in May of 2020. But in their resolving language, they outline some specifics. They assert that racism is a public health crisis affecting our entire county. They want to work to uh, to progress as an equity and justice oriented organization with the Board of Commissioners and its staff leadership continuing to identify specific activities to further enhance diversity and to ensure anti racism principles across Board of Commissioners leadership staffing and contracting. They want to promote equity through all policies approved by the Board of Commissioners and enhance educational efforts aimed at understanding, addressing, and dismantling racism and how it affects the delivery of social services, human services, economic development, and public safety. They go on, uh, and I'm really proud of both the county and the city because there are specifics in their resolutions. Uh, to always promote and support policies that prioritize the health of all people, especially people of color, by mitigating exposure to adverse child experiences, continue ongoing racial equity training with the goal of reaching all Board of Commissioner agency leadership and staff, and encourage racial equity training among all partners, grantees, vendors, and contractors. Identify clear goals and objectives, including periodic reports to the Board of Commissioners to assess progress and capitalize on opportunities to further advance racial equity. The City of Columbus uh, and their Board of Health also declared uh, racism as a public health uh, crisis sponsored by Councilwoman Priscilla Tyson. And in their declaration, it says the city of Columbus has implemented aggressive strategies to address infant mortality in the black community and Columbus Public Health has established an equity section under the leadership of the mayor with recognition that not everyone in Columbus has the same opportunities to be healthy, that there are differences in health based on race, ethnicity, sex, neighborhood, income, education, sexual orientation, gender identity, and other factors. They further state in their whereas clause that members of Columbus City Council have steadfastly supported efforts that focus on improving the quality of life and equity for each Columbus resident. These efforts include Council's creation of the Commission on Black Girls in 2018, ongoing support for small minority businesses, and the city's work to implement recommendations of the disparity study, the creation of My Brother's Keeper program in 2015, funding and support for the Columbus Women's Commission, the Mayor's Office of Education, fair housing support, efforts to curb eviction, with, which disproportionately impacts people of color. 
And then finally, I just want to share a couple of the statements of primary one health. We are a health organization, so we are addressing directly health care of the individuals of Columbus and Franklin County. Um, we are establishing a committee led by people of color that include boy, board members, consumers and family, staff and community partners to help construct a comprehensive plan of action to address racism and health disparities. The ultimate goal is to ensure health equity and the provision of culturally and linguistically competent services and operations to align with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services culturally and linguistically appropriate standards in healthcare, otherwise known as CLASS. And so all three of these entities are really focused on why, uh, and first of all, in order to address inequities and discrimination, we have to declare what racism is. And so my initial question to the panel, I want you each to introduce yourselves, but I want you also to talk about um, your role in racial justice as a health crisis. So I'm going to start with uh, Councilwoman Tyson. If you would start with introducing yourself and um, sharing your role regarding racial justice as a health crisis. Uh, uh, thank you um, to our moderator, moderator and my dear friend, um, Charlene Tavares. We've been friends since high school. So I uh, certainly thank you for your work and your advocacy, um, uh, not only at the city council, but again, you mentioned the state house and the work that you're doing right now to make sure that all residents in Columbus, uh, regardless of their ability to pay, are able to receive health care services from primary one health to be able to move themselves forward. Because if you're not healthy, you cannot do really, as we all know, when you're not healthy, you cannot move forward. And um, so, again, I'm Priscilla Tyson. I am a Columbus City Council member, and I've been on council now for 14 years. Uh, for me, uh, and I, um, for me, it's always been around how do we help to enhance the residents' quality of life? And as you um, begin to think about um, this topic of racism as a public health crisis, one, it was important to have this resolution for declaration, because if you cannot, if a city cannot declare that racism exists, if you don't make that declaration, you really can't do any other other initiatives and move them forward. So one, you have to declare, have that statement. And then, um, and two, that the reason this was so important is not only because of the declaration, but it also then meant that we as council had more to do to be able to move race to um, look at racism because racism does exist in every aspect of lives. I mean, you think especially around the social determinants of health, it's all about racism. And so um, so thinking of thinking that further from that standpoint, the declaration, and I was really pleased that um, 30 to over 3,200 business leaders and individuals signed on to that resolution saying they supported that racism is a public health crisis. And from that point, some there have been some initiatives from the private sector that I think are important in regard to this topic. But this, and when I mentioned we got these 3,200 signatures, we didn't as council go out and seek those signatures. Two individuals were, were critically important going out and saying we support that. And that's John Lowe of Jenny's Ice Cream. And it had, and also um, uh, Haley Bollinger from, um, Store, Story Forge, and they have a group called the Conscious Capitalism of Columbus, and they helped get all those signatures uh, for the support of this resolution. And based upon that declaration, a number of things have also happened from the private sector, because it wasn't just about what we're going to do. We can talk about that a little bit later, but um, I would just say that uh, John Lowe himself, he went out, um, went across the country, talking to all of the Jenny's ice cream or um, um, businesses, their other businesses of the country. He also had Stacey Abrams come in and talk about the fair fight with their employees. And uh, Nationwide has certainly stepped up with a $10 million gift 
for pediatric, um, for the Pediatric Innovation Fund to improve lives in Linden. Also, we have Ohio State University stepped up with a million dollars that also is supporting um, um, the work of um, looking at health care and looking at ra racial injustice at the uh, and anti-racism for the Wexner Medical Center. And um, so I also, so the importance of that work and firstly for the corporate sector, then we can talk later about the private sector. It was critically important that now they have to step up and do something. So if you've signed on to it, what are you gonna do to eradicate racism? I also wanna mention um, that the Columbus Board of Health also passed that resolution of racism as a public health crisis, as well as the city and county local food plan also did that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilwoman Tyson. I'm, I wanna go next to uh, Director Bivens. Um, if you would talk a little bit more about the purpose of a declaration is to, to spur change, but what initiatives are you seeing to spur this change? Thank you so much. Um, you know, when we talk about a declaration, when the commissioners initially did this um, back in May, as you stated, you know, for me, it was really historic and I'm gonna just go off of script just really quick. You know, as they were reading the declaration, I thought to myself, what would have happened if our leaders 300 years ago, 400 years ago would have paused and just said, this isn't right. And what we're doing is going to impact not only a generation, but generations and generations and generations. And, you know, during that time when they read the declaration during um, general session, I cried. Because I said, no one during that time had the courage, you know, that was in leadership, of course, to stand up and say, this is not right other than those who were being oppressed. So for me, the declaration from the commissioner's perspective is an action plan. It's no longer saying that something is wrong. It's no longer hand, standing behind data and stating that, you know, 17% of the population is made up of black people, but 31% are being incarcerated. We spout those numbers and everyone clutches their pearls, but what is the action behind it? in order to hold people accountable, including ourselves and our systems, in order to invoke real change. So for the county, we've done several things and there's still a lot of work to do, but I commend the commissioners as well as everyone else, city council and everyone for being bold during this time and saying enough is enough. We are going to not skirt around it. We're going to be very intentional and call it what it is, which is racism. So for the commissioner, some of the things we've done is we've they've invested an historic amount of um, dollars into racial equity training and implicit bias training and racial equity training that went over the 400 years of slavery that many of us um, know about. We contracted through Courtney Kerrigan through Raise the Bar. Um, we created the Family Stabilization Unit that deals with um, the, pro the predominant population that interfaces with the juvenile justice system, which is our black and brown children. And we have aligned all of our human service agencies so that when those families interface with those agencies, we are being intentional and laser focused on hand holding those families and getting into the homes to figure out what stabilization will look like for those homes with the high touch um, mobility um, um, navigator. Um, of course, as many of us, we've um, we've uh, made uh, Juneteenth a paid holiday. Um, the state and the Senate passed that as well. Creation of, um, we created the diversity and inclusion um, equity council, as well as looking at our contracts. Um, many times with our contracts, you know, um, it's an RFP process, but now we're asking the questions, how diverse is your board? How many people do you serve? And then how many of those people are really being impacted? The people that are really falling short in the social terms of health categories, which we know are women, black and brown um, in our communities. As well as again, we've adopted the, um, the commissioners adopted a racial equity um, as a core principle in county government on November the 14th, 2020. Um, it is to be infused in all of our county agencies. The commissioners are holding us as leaders accountable to ensure our leaders and our systems are being looked at from a very microscopic eye to ensure that we're not uh, continue on with policies that continue to hold people back. Um, as well as um, the commissioners established and appointed Franklin County, the um, Racial Equity Council. 
Um, so those are just some of the things we've done, but predominantly, particularly with our contracts, um, with our we've our, we've established a um, a DNI um, position that really deals with our contractual partners, particularly those in construction trades and other and other business aspects of the government. When we look at who's receiving the contracts, many times you know we look at MBEs, but it's a small amount as it relates to construction trades. So we established the uh, Building Futures program and really trying to target individuals who are not predominantly made up in the construction trades program. And we did that up over a year ago, probably two years ago. Um, and pretty much I'm going to stop talking because I don't want to monopolize the time, but those are just some of the things we've done as a county and I hope I didn't miss anything. Thank you very much, Director Bivens. Uh, Elizabeth, I, I want to go to you and from your perspective, what are you seeing in the community initiatives to address uh, racism as a public health crisis and to mitigate uh, the discrimination and in inequities? Well, thank you. And I'll say as a business owner, uh, Ms. Joy Bivens, you know, you think about what people don't realize just in the background of just you 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 do all this work, you get the degrees, you get the certifications, you do all this work, and then it's still so hard uh, to go out here and make a living and 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 be your best, you know, to get in the door. So I think those are those are some of the things that I see uh, Senator Tavares on the the broader scale. We're seeing lots of movement on uh, the macro level, right? Organizationally and policy wise, which obviously, as we stated, we need to declare it. Right, and then we need these policies and programs to be put in place. I sit in an, a unique position as a business owner who does both executive coaching and consulting, organizational consulting. I work with both organizational culture and DEI consulting work. And um, I would say there's a lot of great movement as it relates to the policy piece, but we really have to keep pushing because sometimes what I see is that individuals sometimes fall short, right? So we've got this policy, right? Or we've got, we've met our, our quota, um, but have you done the hard work? So um, I have the pleasure of both consulting folks of color as it relates to processing what racial stress feels like. And I also have the opportunity to consult um, an executive coach with some folks of the majority culture who are trying to maneuver how to do better and be better. And, and, you know, when I think about, uh, I do primarily coaching, right? But on the, um, with that clinical background, it really is interpersonal, intrapersonal work. And so um, I think it's great to see, again, the, I think the the broader processes have to happen, but I'm hoping to see more folks lean in individually. We've seen a lot of book clubs and things of that nature, but it really does take to get in that mirror and um, be honest and, and know that it's okay, right? To be able to acknowledge that perhaps you've fallen short. We're all humans, right? And so that's the nature of being human. Uh, but we need to be able to acknowledge those shortcomings so that we can move forward. So I've seen it from that perspective. And then I also have the pleasure of leading the Black Community Ambassador Support Program. And what we've done with that, which is really bananas to me that in 2020, this, this really hasn't been done, but we're offering support, regular support to black helpers. So that's clinicians, um, that's organizers, that's coaches, that's nurses. Um, and what we've seen with that work is that there needs to be a space for folks to come and catch their breath to, to build themselves back up, especially black and brown folks who are dealing with both the pandemic on the COVID side as well as racism. So it's been a pleasure to see that. It's also been disheartening, right? To see um, the folks who are out here on the front lines, many of them working for those of you on the panel, right? And doing that great work um, on that ground floor are also struggling because they're carrying so much weight. So um, it's, it's, I think, again, the, the organizational piece is great. I would love to see more individuals lean in and really do that interpersonal work because you can have a policy in place you can hire more folks of color, but if your heart and mind don't change, those folks aren't gonna feel comfortable in that space. And you're muted, uh, Senator. Thank you very much. I'm glad you raised that point about the individual um, actions, the individual 
and interpersonal kinds of uh, not only looking at ourselves, but also taking action to to make changes to how we think and the lens we see things through. Uh, it's important because if individuals don't change, no matter what policy or program you put in place, you can have blockers, people that do everything they can to make sure that policy isn't implemented or that program is not successful. So um, to the other panelists, I, I'd really like you to talk about um, your thoughts about how the individual can impact the way community services are delivered uh, to meet the needs of our community. And whoever wants to go first. So can I just say, I like the way that I'm um, surely to say a blockers, I call them haters. Yeah. So I love it. So I think the way that individuals can assist with um, engagement right now is like to Joy, to um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Joy's point, I always wanna call her Joy, is to really lean in and understand, first of all, what services are being even delivered in the neighborhoods, right? Get an understanding of the landscape of who's delivering those services, who are they supposed to service? Are the services getting to those individuals and then if they're not, if you know that there's a underserved or underrepresented population, then engage with that organization um, in order to ensure that those resources are distributed equitably, right? And then the other thing I think would be beneficial is, I think many times as organizations, when you look at county government, it's massive, right? We're trying to service 1.3 million people every day. We're not going to get it right every, we're not going to get it right all the time. And there are some blind spots that we have so that when we send out surveys and we're asking for community engagement and come to the table and help us understand when we did the poverty blueprint plan, we went out and asked the community, those living in poverty, how, what are we doing wrong? What do we need to do more of? And how can we assist you in moving up that economic mobility ladder? So individuals, when those opportunities are given, whether it's through a survey or through an interview, someone's directly asking, please just do not feel that your voice is not gonna be heard because it will. Um, it is the people that we work for. And again, when I look at that poverty blueprint plan, it is not the commissioner's plan. It is the people's plan. So we as individuals have an obligation to the community that we service to lean in, engage, ask the right questions. And if we see something or some a underrepresented population not receiving services, let us know so that we can assure those services get to the right individuals. Councilwoman Tyson, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, again, I think that when you're asking the question, what can an individual do? An individual can do a couple, can do things differently. One, what does that, can that person do? They can, if you're in a role like mine, you have the ability to do a couple things. One, yes, you can change policy. You have, you because you have, and, and how do you change policy? By understanding data. Just like Joy just mentioned, they went out and asked the community what, you know, what were the, the issues or concerns? You know, we also, although we have a lot of data that we can get from, um, from, from the um, American Community Survey, there's tons of data. There's tons of data. And the reason we can talk about racism as a public health crisis is because of what the data says. We would not even have to have a racism as a public health crisis if, if, if we could look at numbers and see that everyone was treated the fairly, equitably. You wouldn't have to do, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. But the facts are the data speaks for itself. The data speaks for itself. We, so when we think about, you know, you have our black babies dying at two to two and a half times more than white babies, since we're talking about health. Or you look at, you know, black um, ma uh, maternal maternal uh, maternal um, death. You look at what's two and a half to three times more. I mean, I could go and list, you know, you know, obviously race is a public health crisis. So let's talk about the social determinants of health when we're making, you know. Um, we're making 60 cents on the dollar because you have lack, you don't have money. That means you're not going to be able to be, you're not going to be able to live your best quality of life because you're worried about the stress of how to make it. So when you get the data, you take that data 
And then you need to be able, and, it's, and it, it is unfortunate, like I said, it is unfortunate that we have to be even having these conversations. But as Joy mentioned, if you think about 400 years of what has happened to people of color, here we are having these conversations. And what do we have to do? We have a responsibility to make change, to do our part. And so some things that um, from a, as a public servant, we have certainly won. You have to again recognize racism exists, and so even in our field of at, at city city council, we now have a race equity action team, and that team we have now gone through worked with. Charlene, you'll love this. The National League of Cities because they have a race and equity and leadership. Um, uh, um, division and they have now been working with Columbus on what's called the real. So we've had two trainings so far. We have like a racial equity team. So we are looking at um, policies from an equity lens and that changes and, and we're speaking about that. We're talking about Tell us about like if you're looking at housing, if if most people of color are only at 54% of AMI, how do we then look at housing from a 54% of AMI? We've also um, we mentioned earlier that well the Commission on Black Girls, all of that work talking to over 422 Black girls to get their opinions of what's their current quality of life like to make those changes. You know we just passed working with. Um, uh, the the Community Relations Commission on the Crown Act to making sure we talked about hair earlier that we want to present I mean, I mean, to prevent discrimination based on um, race based hairstyles. And so now if that if you are discriminated against because of the way you're wearing your hair in the city of Columbus, based on public uh, public accommodations, housing and, uh, and and employment, you know, that is now against the law. We also just implemented housing for all legislation. So which means you pro prohibit landlords from discriminating against tenants due to their source of income. So section eight, you can take, you have to take section eight. That's what someone has. Uh, we just did a um, record ceiling initiative because that basically affects mostly people of color. And we did an imagine uh, safety initiative to look at, um, which also put on the ballot, the civilian police review board, which those names were just introduced yesterday. Um, no knock raids. Uh, and we're looking at, um, well, we also instituted background checks for hate group affiliation. So I'm naming some things that that's because when you start talking, if you are now moving in a, looking at racial equity and get the data, you then make those type of changes. And, then, and again, but it has to start with also, you know, education of our staff, education of our staff. And, and so everyone's coming along at, you know, learning about the changes that um, why we have to have these conversations on on racial equity. Thank you very much. And and I'm glad you you mentioned uh, educating uh, your staff because we're all on this continuum um, becoming more culturally competent, culturally appropriate. Many of us are moving towards cultural humility, uh, but there's a continuum. Not all of us are at the same place, but we have to be moving further down the continuum to be more appropriate in how we deliver services, how we interact with each other. We have a question from Joni on how much do issues around um, the Columbus Police Department play into the problems with racism in Columbus? You mentioned the, uh, the Columbus Civilian Review Board, uh, which was established because of some of the issues that the community residents felt were not being addressed with the Columbus City Police Department. Um, and, and you can answer this or, or anyone on the panel. Um, do you believe um, that issues with the Columbus Police Department um, play into the problems that we're having with racism or are because of racism? Well, I just have to say that you know, racism does exist and exist in every aspect. It, you know, it's everywhere. And so is it in the Columbus Police Department? Yes, it is in the Columbus Police Department. And as a city, we have we have acknowledged that. The mayor has acknowledged it because it is it, it, there isn't any place that 
as a woman of color, there isn't any place that it doesn't exist. And, and so, uh, and but, but, but with that acknowledgement, certainly um, the police department will be, again, um, working the uh, safety director moving forward, you know, and ensuring that as we don't want racism to be there, but we know it's there. So what are we doing as a, and as a city, we've got to do everything to try to remove the people that are, are, are racist. We need to do more training. I mean, there we need to, as I just stated, to look at, you know, background checks with hate affiliation groups to be able to, you know, uh, again, um, making sure that looking at how we use our dollars so that we're, we're like demilitarizing some of the police force. So it, we recognize that it's there, but I would also say that it's, it's, it's not only in the police department, it's it's, and you said it's 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 all around us. It's everywhere. It's in every sector of our society. On that point, Elizabeth, I wanted you to address the issues around um, racism and the impacts on mental health. Uh, you're a clinician, so I'm sure you've addressed that in some of the self care that you're providing uh, to some of the other clinicians and. Um, first responders and those that are dealing with the COVID-19 and other tragedies? Yeah, thanks for that. A couple of thoughts come to mind as Councilwoman Tyson mentioned, we have all this data. Uh, one of the things we have to be really cautious about though, with a lot of the data that we get will lead us to really just focus on racism as it relates to poverty and you know, you know, folks who are only in certain situations. But we all know from from senator all the way to you know the the doorman at a hotel whatever it is right we all experience it so i think first of all to just really check in um because sometimes we can get as as administrator biven said earlier we just round off the numbers you know we're saying this and saying that but we have to always be clear that it it's it permeates i just saw on the news that the, um, I think it's the GM of the Toronto Raptors, right? Who had the incident with the police officer in their arena a few years back. The police officer filed a, a case against him. He just now dropped it, even though the video came out um, last year regarding the incident, which clearly indicated the police officer was in the wrong. So I think it's just important that we check in on that. And I'm so glad you asked about the mental health because when we say racism is a public health crisis, mental health and behavioral health are part of health and so i've been as much as i honor and completely respect the fact that during covid right we've had an extreme focus on physical health obviously because it's a disease that affects the body but we have across the board this is a stressful time we're living in no matter who you are just because of the lot loss of choice right loss of of opportunity and option as it relates to where you go and what you do so when you combine the stressors that come come with a pandemic with racism what i've seen this year is you know uh, black folks are it's a it's probably more than a double whammy right so you have and and then the interesting thing about the the connection between physical health and mental health is that uh, physical health is a mitigator for the stressors that you oftentimes experience because of racism. But racism impacts your physical health, right? So it's like this, this very um, dangerous cycle to where it's almost like you can't catch your breath because you're either physically ill because of social um, injustice and, and disparities in our health system, and then because you're stressed out about that, right? Your mental health is a challenge. So um, one of the things I've seen um, is that even for, for people, black and brown folks, we don't realize there's a stigma for mental health across the board. Black folks have an, an additional stigma that they work against, but sometimes not realizing that that feeling you're feeling, that's because of racial trauma or that feeling you're feeling is, there's a name for that, right? And so when you look at the combination, again, of, of COVID, and and racism what what i've seen on the front lines especially because then those folks 
have the responsibility of putting their clients and their patients first. So you've got a doctor, a nurse, a counselor, even faith leaders struggling, but but everyone goes to them, right, to get help. Even executive leaders, we, we're on the Equity Now Coalition, several of us, we come to get together every Thursday. We're solving all the world's problems, but how do we take care of ourselves when we're the answer to the city, to our children, to our families, to our staff? And so um, it's, a, it's a constant uh, for me to remind folks that the mental health part, it, that has to be part of the equation when we talk about equality, even the movement, what our uh, tagline for the Black Community Ambassadors has been is that self-care is an act of resistance. So taking care of yourself is part of the movement. What we want is for all of us to be well. And while we're pushing for these policies, we've got to do the work we can on the inside, right? To gift ourselves with what we need to be healthy. Thank you for that. I think a lot of times people disconnect the, the, the mind, the, the head from the body and don't understand that one impacts the other, uh, that you can't be truly healthy mm -hmm. if the, the mind, the mental health isn't addressed and the body, which, as you said, um, you know, can mitigate um, if it's unhealthy and, and they both work against each other if we don't bring them in alignment. And self-care is critically important, particularly for people of color who have multiple stressors, whether it's overt acts of racism or um, implicit or microaggressions or all kinds of ways that that we're dealing with these acts and you know some of them have been highlighted on social media the karens the bobs that don't believe we should be where we are when we are and don't believe we should have the same advantages the same abilities as other individuals have so the mental and I, health and the self-care is really important, and I'm glad that you're really focusing in on that with young people and leaders of various systems. And I would add, too, since we're all doing the work, this is one of the things that I saw all of 2020. We're doing the work. We, as Black folks, feel obligated every time there's an opportunity to educate. We're educating, whether it's on social media or in your office, and then there's this exhaustion that comes and it really becomes martyrdom right so we're we have to learn like how do we how do we continue to advocate right for for equality right but also take care of ourselves and and for black folks that's a real that's a real conundrum because you're saying well how can i take care of myself when there's people dying on the streets every day um but but otherwise you're dying a slow death right through martyrdom because you're constantly pushing so that's another thing that that we have to be careful on and as it relates to our lifespan so then that plugs back into physical health when you're stressed out every day over years you're going to get some some physical health diagnosis right and then the, the lifespan it's not just from poverty black folks who are are wealthy middle class you know doing well financially we're not we're not immune to this so it's it's really checking in and now again, because we're we're so thankful there's this movement, but at the same time, you know, balancing how much we give to the movement and how much do we make sure that you take care of self because your individual well-being is the movement as well. Director Bivens, you see a lot of individuals who are really struggling at the Department of Job and Family Services. Um, you see people who in, in many cases are, are dealing with mic, microaggressions, overt acts of racism and dealing with poverty, dealing with um, environmental issues in their home or in their community. What would you say um, to that individual on how they can address these acts of racism against them or aggressions against them um, as they're coming in and seeking help, are there some ways that you and your staff members can assist them in better preparing themselves 
to deal with all that they're dealing with. Yeah, so thank you. Um, going back to what uh, Elizabeth Joy just said, every time she talks about the martyrdom and all the work that we all do as leaders, I get so convicted because I know she's talking to me personally because <laughs> I have not had a vacation in a year, probably a little longer. But one of the things I think that, you know, when people come in and, you know, they have expressed or they've been on the phone expressing, you know, uh, an ought that has been brought against them or something they've experienced, you know, one of the things we try to get people to understand is like my grim, I'm a, I'm a real basic person. My grandmother used to say this thing, you know, um, when you walk into a kitchen and you smell something cooking, whether it's fried chicken or fish, fish don't smell like fried chicken. So if someone feel, if you feel like someone has done something to you, it may not be, it may not just be you in your head. It really could be the thing that you're seeing what it is, right? So letting them know, first of all, it's okay to even question it. Because what we find is people living in poverty, you know, they don't want to make waves. If I say something, then someone's going to take something away from me or something's going to happen to me or someone's going to show up on my porch or I'm not going to be able to get something for my family. But we have to empower, we empower people to say, it's okay. You know, if that's how you feel and this is what you state that has happened to you and you're feeling this right now, you have to explore those feelings and own those feelings. And then the other thing is who is the entity or the individual. Now, I will tell you what Job and Family Services, the commissioners hold us at a very high regard, a very, very high standard. And I tell people the service that you receive at the agencies that are receiving, that, that provide, administer uh, human services, whether it's Job and Family Services, aging, child support, I don't care. You should receive better services at our agencies than you receive at a five star restaurant. First of all, if you come to our agency, you don't want to be there, right? You're coming there or you're calling there because you really need something. So to, pro to protect your dignity, it is, I have infused with our, with, our, um, with our team and our staff, it is our job to provide the highest quality of customer service to our families and residents by maintaining their dignity as possible. So when we empower individuals, we find out who the who, and then there's a process, find out what the process is for, you know, even what vocalizing a complaint, right? Because I think, again, many times people don't do that. They, they keep their head low. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to cause waves. And we have to start holding pe people accountable, even our own selves, right? Maybe it wasn't a day that maybe I wasn't racist that day. Maybe I was just having a bad day, but Having a bad day, does that allow you to have a mean and nasty attitude when administering a public service or something to someone who is in need? So again, empowering individuals, finding out what the process is for filing you know, complaints, and also allowing them to own their feelings. And if more helps need, if, and, and if there's additional help that needs to be administered, then uh, directing them to the mental health resources that are available to them in the community. I appreciate um, those comments, especially around customer service, because, you know, again, many people who do not appreciate, do not like, um, are negative towards a, a black or brown or person of color, um, are doing it because they can, and they may be in a power position where the individual is coming in and asking for something and they're in the position to say yes or no. And they can say yes or no with a nasty attitude or a disrespectful attitude. Uh, one of the things that I know each of you uh, believe in is respecting those that we say we want to serve. You know, Joy just said, allowing them to, to, to own their feelings and to believe them, you know, if they're feeling some kind of way, if they feel that there's been a microaggression or an overt uh, act of racism towards that person. But each of you have been in leadership positions, you're interacting with agencies, organizations, and individuals what would you recommend as a call to action, uh, whether it's an organization action, an individual action that you, you would like to recommend to the residents of 
um, the city of Columbus, the county of Franklin? What what call to action uh, and what what steps can an individual take uh, to ameliorate uh, racism as a public health crisis? And whoever wants to go first. <laughs> Thank you. So, first of all, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation as um, even doing the work each and every day. It's still important to hear the other different points of view. And especially when it, you know, from listening to to Joy, certainly speak to the fact that, you know, we know that when individuals are generally utilizing the services that that they don't they don't want to be there, but they're there because of circumstances in their within their 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 family. And that no matter what, we have to treat everybody with dignity and respect. And, you know, for her saying that, you know, every day she's talking to her team about how to treat people with dignity and respect. Um, because again, you know, if it wasn't for God, we certainly could be one of those people coming and getting those services. And so we have a responsibility to serve to, and to humbly serve everyone. And um, and so listening to Elizabeth Joy and, and listen to her comments just around um, the individuals that she is seeing in regards to mental health and what is required. You cannot function. You know, you, you don't have mental health and physical health. It's all health. And if we don't put them together, I mean, if I can physically, everything could be going okay, but mentally, if I'm not, you're right, I can't move physically. And so it's it's all connected. But And then if you have the issue of race, that how we, you know, just racism in itself, with, you know, just weighs you down, it just the things that happen. And so... Um, I would just say that one thing that the, the listening audience and the viewing audience can do is to, again, we started out with the declaration that racism is a public health crisis. For the individuals to say, it is that. And then what am I going to do about it? You know, I think it is, um, and it does affect Black and Brown people. And it's okay to say that, you know, it does exist. It doesn't take away from whomever you are, but just you need to know that it exists. And that my call to action is that to educate yourself. Educate yourself about racism. Take the training classes. Be open to, to learning and gathering in. And then deciding, what are you going to do differently? How do you change your behavior? And if you are in, just how do you change your behavior? And so if you are in... in, in working in an environment that you work, you know, that you're working and dealing with working with people, how are you going to treat people differently? How is your organization going to treat people differently? But one, acknowledge it and then able to make sure that you're taking an action to make sure that you are going to be focused on equity, not equality, equity, and eradicating racism. Thank, Thank you. you. Elizabeth? There's so much. <laughs> I've appreciated the conversation as well. Um, a couple of suggestions. One, I would say, um, first suggestion on an organizational level, again, doing this consulting work is, again, don't fall short or don't sell the, the commitment short by stopping at policy or stopping at meeting a quota. There is no way to do this work and to make it real without every individual doing that internal work. I would also add that, um, and, and Robin speaks about this in uh, White Fragility, the way that we define racism causes folks to want to distance themselves from it. And so the first things a, a majority person may say, I'm not racist. Um, because I don't, because racist equals mean or racist equals hateful, right? So I would encourage all of us to just kind of like check in on the definitions we're using when we talk about racism, because we have to all own it. And all of us, right, have bias within ourselves, even towards our own people. We're all watching the same media. We're all hearing the same messages. And so just doing that check in and check down to humble yourself, like, we can't make progress if your answer is I'm not racist. Because there's no work to do right at that point. So I would challenge uh, organizations really 
um, who then have individuals who lead those organizations to, to go beyond because you can easily make progress in policy and hiring, but still have a culture that isn't welcoming, that isn't equitable, that isn't inclusive, and then we we still will have missed the mark. I will also uh, just just call out to our brothers and sisters and other family members of color, black folks. We have to take care of ourselves, no matter what position you're in, no matter no matter how much money you make or don't. Whatever role you have, leader, um, Joy Bivens is smiling now because every Thursday, if they give me the mic, I tell them we've got to take care of ourselves because while we need a lot of external work to happen, we can gift ourselves as Black folks with a healthier life today. There's no policy change that has to happen for a lot of the stuff that we can gift ourselves. So I'm going to always challenge folks to take care of yourself. Take that vacation, Miss Joy. Um, and, and yes, and you too, Ms. Tyson, I see you, <laughs> but we have to also commit to why we're doing this work to take care of ourselves, because it, it can't be that we're waiting on something to happen. We are also part of the solution in taking care of ourselves. And really for some of us, many of us, we suffer from our own forms of internalized racism. So we have to do that work where we're kind of hounding ourselves while we have those external experiences happening. So that would be my suggestion for action steps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Director Bivens. Yes, ma'am. So just, you know, I think um, um, both the panelists covered it very well. I think particularly, you know, talking about we need to first of all own our own implicit bias because we perpetuate a system too. Again, I may not be racist, but I got I have some implicit bias. There's a joke between my husband. You'll probably catch it later. He told me I'm biased to, to intelligent men. I think that compliments him somewhere, but I'm like, whatever. So, so I think we have to own our, our biases, but also I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this to leaders who oversee systems. When we see something that is happening out there, that is not the time to have the outward mindset. Those poor people. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened to them. No, 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 no. That's happening into your stuff too. own your stuff. Look at your own organization and figure out where there needs to be change and not a change of just checking boxes like both Elizabeth Joy and Councilwoman Tyson has said, but changing the culture. Right? Holding people truly accountable saying we will not take that here. We do not stand for that. But again, and not cringing up when we talk about racism, you know, we get some people get really uncomfortable and they like cringe up like, well, you know, that was then. No, that's now. But again, looking at it, having an inward mindset of we need to get out and do this for those people or is only happening out there. No, 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 no. It's happening in your stuff too. take care of your own house first and then you go out there and to assist in some of that. But I think individuals hold leaders accountable to doing that work as well. Thank you. I, I want to share my call to action as well. Uh, it's really important as um, Director Bivens just shared that we look internally, look at our own house, look at our own self. Um, I think it's important for those of us who run large uh, organizations or systems that we have to take a look at what we're doing. I'm proud that we are a woman-led organization, an African-American woman-led uh, organization with me as a CEO and my board chair is an African-American woman. 86% of my staff are women, disproportionately uh, women of color. The women who are on the front lines who are making the least amount of resources, even though nobody in my organization, and this has been for two years now, makes less than $15 an hour. We have great benefits. So you have to look at what are you doing to promote a healthy environment for the people you say are your team members. And then I'm proud to say, and this is my call to action to all organizations, but specifically the for-profit private sector employers in our community. Take a look at your board. I'm proud to say that as a community health center, we are required that 51% of our board members or more, and at my organization, there are more, have to be the patients that we serve. And we have to have the representation of the demographics that we serve. If every organization did that, not just the one of us on board X, Y, and Z, 
but multiple people of color, African Americans and people of color on the for profit and the nonprofit boards. And then take a look at the leadership of your organization. Are all the people of color in the direct uh, line or are they in management, supervision, directors, your C suite? If you're serving a large number of people of color, then your board needs to reflect that as well. So that's my call to action. And then from there, you need to do a cultural audit on your organization to take a look at those HR policies to see if you're recruiting, retaining, and promoting people of color within your organization. Check ourselves first, and then check the organizations and institutions that we're a part of. I appreciate all of you all for being on today's session. I thank uh, Director Carla Williams Scott and the uh, Department of Neighborhoods, as well as the Community Relations Commission uh, for all of your work to bring these tough subjects uh, to the forefront. And uh, Pedro, thank you for your technology. 